I thought Facebook was supposed to make this easy. Okay, maybe they have. Are we live? Somehow, some way? Something is going on here. Oh, yep, the Communications Network is live. Okay, I guess we're Woo live. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network, and I have a special uh, honor and privilege today, and that is to welcome Eric Ash of the Truth Initiative. Thank you. Um, who is... Not for nothing, the uh -oh. inaugural winner. No, this is a yes, good thing. Yes, I've yes. seen the trophy. Like, I've been to your sure offices. <laughs> I've seen the trophy case before, but we get to be part of this you now. Do, so you, you all won the, the inaugural Clarence B. Jones Impact Award. Quite an honor. Which for us, yeah, we are thrilled. This is the first time we've ever given this, and we've yeah. given it to recognize the extraordinary work you all have done over, and I think this is actually worth talking about, and we yeah. will a little bit. You didn't do it in a year. That's right. The work that you've done, right. the, the significant impact that you've achieved, which is, and just to make you blush for a quick minute, teen smoking rates have declined from 23, or was it 26%? 23. 23 down to 6, or below 6% six as right. of today. Right. So, I mean, one way to think about that is there's a bunch of kids dancing right outside the window. I tell you that because you may hear some really fun music. It's not my playlist, I wish. Um, but uh, back in the day, if you looked out there, one of those four kids would have been a smoker. That's right. And now you'd have to pull quite a crowd together. You'd have to put a crowd of 10 kids together to find maybe one who thinks that smoking is cool and is actually a smoker. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's pretty well known at this point. You all had a singular role in helping to make that happen. Mm. So what I'm going to hope that we're going to do over the course of the hours, we're going to obviously take questions from people, but also talk a little bit about how did you do that? And I know you're going to take us through this in San Francisco at ComNet 18, but today maybe it's a little bit more of an informal conversation. Right, right. Um, and maybe the place to start is kind of asking you to sort of run down what you think about a specific word. Uh, I'm not putting you on the spot here. Wow. I kind of am. Yeah, okay. The word Brilliant. is communications, because most of the folks dialing in right yeah, now yeah. serve in communications roles in some capacity or another at a foundation or a nonprofit, so they're in the business of doing good, like yeah. you are. Yeah. And I always think this is fascinating when you ask somebody a word, because we all have different meanings, right? Yeah. We all think of different things when we hear a word. So for you, when you hear the word communications, Eric, what comes to mind? The first word that came to mind was dialogue. It's the first word that came to mind. Um, uh, has it always been that way for you? Is that, the, is, is that sort of question. a relatively new? I think it's probably relatively new for me over the past. I've been at Truth Initiative. It's, it's Since 07, right? Yeah, so is it 11 years? Mm -hmm. um, I lived in Austin, Texas before that. Worked at an ad agency in Austin. If you've ever spent any time in Austin, it's a great place to live. I have. I have never managed to make it into Franklin's, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. Or yeah, Salt yeah. Lake. You know, I don't think I've made it into Franklin's either. I've been to Salt Lake. I've looked at the line. Yeah, the, I, yeah, <laughs> the line, it's a commitment. Um, but 11 years ago, D.C. was not the city that it is today. Oh, yeah. I'm a local. Tell me about it. Right? Yeah, and so that's you, the thought that I would be in D.C. 11 years later um, just was inconceivable. And so um, I think it, that just uh, the reason I say that is a lot has changed for me personally, professionally, um, which, you know, those two worlds more and more are yeah. so intermeshed in terms of my worldview, uh, um, how my family is involved or at least influences what I do professionally for my vocation. And so that sort of engagement, ultimately to answer your question, would I have said that 11 years ago, which now seems like a relatively short amount of time looking back, that's not something I would have said. I would have probably said 11 years ago communication would be me talking at someone. Mm -hmm. And as a Gen Xer, and certainly when we launched in, in sort of like the Gen X time frame, I think that's part of our story and part of our narrative. We were trying not to talk at someone at that time because if you're an Xer, I'm not sure if you're an I Xer. I am an Xer. I, despite the gray hairs, I am, <laughs> I in fact, class of 94. Well, I'm an Xer. And so, you know, we're not joiners by nature. Latchkey oh, no. kids, the tools that were available in that time frame really weren't developed to enhance sort of a dialogue or communication. And so, um, I probably would have said, it's a long way of saying years ago, 11 years ago, I would have said communication was me talking to someone or sort of me, me giving you a point of view or sharing something, but sort of one-to-one, -one, perhaps, mm -hmm. but one directional, certainly, versus a dialogue, which I think is also part and parcel to when you talk about Gen Y, mill uh, millennial centennials, mm -hmm. now that I'm married and have kids, I did, that wasn't the case 11 years ago. There's not a lot of me talking directly at one person and then taking that as like the truth and then moving forward with that. There is every stage of my life things are a dialogue and so I think that just helped frame the way I think about my role in the conversation if you will mm -hmm. um, certainly I think frames the way the brand 
participates with consumers uh, because of how the cohort has changed over time. Um, that was a long answer to a simple question, but it is it is it maybe it sheds a little bit of insight in terms of how uh, how my brain thinks and how the brand's posture has changed over time to I think really honor what's happening in the marketplace. Um, you all, I mean, I, I think one of the things that we recognize and I think we're trying to celebrate with the Jones Award is this idea of iteration and adaptation mm -hmm. because, you know, <clears throat> unlike a lot of organizations, you really have had to travel across generations. Yeah. So, and I'm about to reveal my lack of cultural knowledge here, but I'm assuming like One Direction is different than Bieber is different from, I'm trying to think of somebody who was cool when we were young, like Nirvana, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Talking and, and traveling through different youth culture has to have been a real challenge. How do you do yeah. that? Yeah, that's a great question. We, we do get asked that question from time to time. I, I think uh, our North Star, it's probably a good place to start, Please, has been do what is right for the consumer at the right time. And I stand on the shoulders of people who are much smarter than I am. Uh, our, the people who founded Truth Initiative, formerly known as the American Legacy Foundation, made some extremely difficult choices early on. The decision to build and develop a brand, which seems very obvious today, was very counterculture at the time. And particularly coming out of sort of like public health sort of um, arena, where the the modus was really to, to communicate directional, like an authoritarian figure, like, mm -hmm. here's what you should go do, go do this. Right. And but it, it wasn't C. Ever Coop. It wasn't right. C. Ever Coop, right, right. And it, but well-meaning, and you can think about other health issues, of go get vaccinated, um, wear a condom, like fill in the blank, mm -hmm. very, you have the information, go do this thing. Um, part of the, the psychology behind that is you're treating the audience as if this is a very logical decision that they're making. If you build the business case or the mm -hmm. facts, like if you don't get chicken pox, you will get chicken. I mean, if you don't get vaccinated, you will get chicken pox. It's a, that's not something anybody wants or would wish on themselves. I can make that decision logically. The same thing doesn't apply to something like smoking cigarettes. Because if you think about a 12 to 17 year old, do you have a 17 year old or a teenager in your household by chance? Thankfully, no, but they're on their way and it's their deep ambition in life. I live with a, an eight, almost nine year old and a five year old. Okay, okay. I have a five, a four, and a two year old. So oh, I'm wow. a little bit further behind. There is you. more sleep on your future. I know, just, <laughs> just getting crushed. Uh, <coughs> all boys, so everything I have. Oh, I have all girls. I got, okay. I'm rocking oh, the Obama. Goodness. I'm going to be well taken care yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Well, if you, you've obviously spent time with, with, Teens and adolescents. If you, you know, we talk about it in the sense of like there is the. Well, you exactly right by it's taking time, spending time with because they don't talk to you. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> That's right. been my experience the same, at least lately. You're, the same you're in the same sphere. room. Maybe. The same they allow you to be. Yeah, if you're, if you're lucky. Yeah. Drive me, drop me off. Goodbye. They, um, but you have this sort of rational and irrational that happens, and they can coexist at the same time. And you can see a teenager make a very what appears to be an, uh, an intelligent or a um, well-informed decision. You think, oh my goodness, they're acting like an adult. Mm -hmm. And then they will go and do something that makes no rational sense. And, and those two things, you know, to us would appear to be in conflict, but they're not. They're very, it's a very natural developmental process. And, and so much of the decisions that are going through sort of those filters feed into both of those, those elements, the rational and the irrational. So there was a temptation early on when we launched to try to play to the rational. Mm. When we know, if you just look at our competition, the tobacco industry, way, way, way out in front, understood that if they could appear and appeal to things that necessarily weren't rational. In fact, these were things that weren't even real. It was this promise of what life could be, what this product actually meant and represented. They could appeal to those things that weren't tapped into the rational decision-making process. Because if you use their product as designed, it will kill you. It's designed to kill you. It defies, I win the merit of that argument every single time, but that's not why people make those decisions. Yeah, that's right. And so I think what, what campaigns prior to us were, were, were missing was empathy on the utility that this product provided to the consumer. And so once we sort of understood, oh, there is a real utility here, my job is not to try to diminish the utility. There's momentum around that utility. How do we actually identify the momentum, and then use that momentum to our advantage. That was a massive, massive shift in strategy that we took a lot of heat for. The idea that we were going to develop a brand, cultivate the brand, nurture the brand, protect the brand, the same way that the tobacco industry did, was very counterculture in terms of like public health communications, at least in the field of tobacco. I don't want to 
overstate that. And uh, our founder um, and founding members and founding board members took a huge risk because it hadn't been proven to be true. And I, I think we are having success now because they made that commitment and that departure because they understood like for us to be effective in taking market share away from the tobacco industry, we had to, we had to compete with them on their terms. And that meant we had to have a brand that went head to head and we gave you something of value. In some cases it's logical, in some cases it's just id. But we had to give you that so that we could pull you away into our camp. And so I, I actually can't remember the, how the comp, your original question, <laughs> but I do think the idea of our success, our ongoing success, the foundation was laid early on that we were going to have a brand. Think about it as, a, as, as for the lens of cultivating a brand. and. That has driven every decision that we've made from the inception to now, and that served us well. So this might seem blindingly obvious to you, and I suspect it does, <coughs> but, but why a brand? And I say this because yeah. I've been in this role for about four years, and it's an incredible honor and privilege, but when I first arrived, I remember having a conversation with some colleagues. We were doing a research project, and we were talking about the elements that are required to communicate effectively, and one of the things that we concluded from doing a lot of research, um, in a number of different ways, qualitative and quantitative, and lit reviews was, you need a brand. Yeah. But when we thought about presenting that to the field, to people who work in the foundation and the nonprofit space, which I would presume is, uh, includes a lot of folks in the public health space, we, even internally, there was sort of this reaction of, oh, no, 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 we can't talk about a brand. Brand is sort of antithetical to who people are in the social sector. We don't have brands. Mm -hmm. We have missions. Mm -hmm. um, we went ahead and said brand because that was the right word to describe what you're after. But, but you guys obviously were doing this years out. Yeah. Why a brand, and maybe even, uh, if I can put you on the spot, sort of define what does brand mean in your yeah. view? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Byproduct of having <coughs> a five, a four, and a two-year-old. I was gonna say, that's not from smoking. No, right? it's a constant, like you just, it's just like <laughs> an uh, occupational hazard of having yeah, little I, people. Yeah, you, were, you will be sick for the next decade. incubators. Um, so, let me see if I can sort of uh, do justice to the, that's a big question, it's a good question. Uh, I, I sort of feel like, and I've, say that I've said this before publicly, um, whether you have a, a nonprofit brand or a do-good brand, however you want to fill that category, uh, or whether you think of yourself as a brand or not, the consumer is going to, we're, we are categorizing communication as it's coming to us and brands sure. that are coming through, and it's, it's placing, it's, it's filling space in our head. Mm -hmm. We're either giving permission for things to come in or we're giving permission for, or we're not giving it permission. You're either invited in or you're unwanted, right? That's happening at, at such a high level ongoing that we're not even cognizant of it. Oh yeah, the velocity of that is it's incredible, just, Especially right? today, yeah. compared to when we launched, for right? sure. And so, I, I sort of look at, you can choose to turn a blind eye to that, and you're, you are empowering the consumer to make whatever decision through whatever filter they may have, and they will put you in a space wherever you want to go. And we've, we, I've talked about this with friends of mine that work for nonprofits that really are driven by fundraising. And so we've talked about it through the share of wallet. And so this idea that we are all competing for share of wallet in some way, shape, or form. And there's only so much of that share of wallet to go around. And so how early can you stake out that share? And what is required by you as a brand to get that share of wallet from the consumer? Well, I need to understand that. And, and, and particularly for the nonprofit space, I think we're conditioned to think, I'm doing really, really good things. Mm -hmm. And so because I'm doing good things, somehow, on, because of the merit of what I'm doing, people are going to pay attention to me. And I think that is a fallacy. I think that's a mistake. I think every organization, no matter what you're doing, you are competing for market share. And to think you are not competing for market share, I think is naive. I think we have the benefit if I can put it that way, I, I, I should say it's, it's, it's more binary for us because if we do our job well, less people die of cancer. If we do our job well, less people are purchasing and buying cigarettes and smoking them. And so I use that term competing for market share because I think that's actually what, that is what we're doing for sure. Yeah, that's how you measure it. That's right? how we measure it. How many kids are smoking right, versus right. how many are not. Right, how many are not smoking. And right. so I, I think the idea, now w to your point, what does a brand mean for every organization? I think there's, that's probably going to be fluid for a lot of organizations, certainly in terms of what do brands look like today when you can be primarily a digital space brand versus a brand that lives in the real world. Um, people being brands in a way as influencers. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a, it's nebulous, but I do think this idea of 
there is a interaction and a relationship that is taking place between the individual and said brand where there is a currency that's being exchanged in some way, shape, or form, whether it's currency of time, currency of attention, currency of my adoration through a like or a share mm -hmm. or a transfer of money. And all of those elements go in, that experience, all of those experiences, the senses that are engaged, all, in my opinion, go into to edifying, hopefully, if it's in our case, um, the role or position that a brand has. And, and so we, it, I think it's in more cases, it's what does not go into actually helping create a brand because I think it's all of those things. And in some cases for us, part of what goes into shape our brand are the, the very indirect measures. And so, I don't know if you're, are you a griller, by the way? A griller like in barbecue? Yes, yes. Uh, I fired it up this year. I would not call myself a griller, but so I, I have, I have <coughs> fire and cooked things. One of the hardest things for me to get my head around is this indirect heat thing. As someone, you mentioned Franklin yeah, yeah, Barbecue. Yeah. Like I was, I read his book recently, which was fascinating. But he, he was going into the science of sort of like how the indirect heat. And I think the temptation for us, me as a brand, is to be so direct. It's the direct heat. Mm -hmm. When in many cases, depending upon what you're trying to accomplish, it's the indirect heat that actually has the biggest impact on on what's happening inside the grill. I've never used this metaphor before, so I hope I'm loving translate. This. I'm loving this. I was like, as it came to me. And so in some cases in building a brand, the way we think about the world, I talk about it through how do we shape the cultural narrative, mm -hmm. but some of that is, it's very, it's the indirect heat as grilling towards sort of like your product. And so- And is that particularly be true of because of your audience or is this just generally true, you think? That's a good question. As teenagers are so influenced by the, the power peers. of influence is uh, undeniable. I, I think it's probably, it's probably both. I have, to, I have to think about that. I don't have a good immediate response for you on that, but I do know, particularly for us, so you mentioned earlier, smoking rate was 22, 23%. When we, we in 2014, we kind of did a massive reboot. When we realized, I had on my whiteboard in my office this bullseye of like the smoking rate and who was left smoking. And we sort of were charting out year over year, like how the smoking rate was going down and how that bullseye people who were smoking was going down, down, down. And it suddenly dawned on me, there are more people with us than against us. Mm -hmm. And then we looked at all of the case studies and all of the brands and all the momentum of, um, and even in some of the political realm where being for something, being so much more powerful than being against something. Being against something works in a short run, but I think if you're, as you're trying to build momentum over time, being for something is very, very important, right? Okay, yeah. And so, we decided to sort of look at the lens of well, what would it look like if we started this to, to try to influence from the outside in, and it was so freeing. Number one, it gave us permission to be for something. Of course, we're against the tobacco industry, and that's a very powerful foil for us, and we're not gonna pivot away from that. But starting to shape like, what are we for, and what does the world look like, and who are we for, and why? What mm -hmm. pockets of the population were that we are for? We're for the LGBTQ, we're for African Americans, and, and uh, we're for women. The tobacco industry has a long track record of not being for those those populations. And so we can frame it as they're against, we're for, or we can talk about how we're for and why, why that's the case. Mm -hmm. And so if you start to pivot that out even further, I start to think through what are some of the drivers of influencing people smoking and where are the influences coming from? And so there's a great track record at smoking in the movies. And there's a lot of science that shows that when kids are exposed to smoking in the movies, it has a a, a very significant impact on their willingness to go try smoking. And so what we need in movie theaters is not a truth ad, although I'd love that space. What I need is to, to remove smoking from that, from that exposure, and that will start to denormalize in a way that an ad would never be able to do because it's not an experience where you're consuming an ad. It's the actual cultural framing of the behavior. And if I can get those moments removed, the influence of that moment is going to change. <clears throat> and so we started to think through, well, how does that apply in sort of like our world? And so one of our early campaigns in 2014 when we sort of did the reboot was to say, if you, you have influence, and if you were posting pictures on your social graph of you smoking, you are essentially giving free advertising to the tobacco industry. You are an unpaid spokesperson. And so, playing into that idea of you have a role here and you know when I was in high school to see somebody smoking you had to go by like the bowling alley dating myself or by uh, the 7-eleven to see people actually smoking and it was like I could see people smoking but your exposure may be to the 10 people who actually saw you where social media that happens at scale oh sure and um 
And so we started to think through what would it look like for the brand to not only start thinking about the outside in and removing some of those influences, but then also empowering people to do that work instead of me telling you like what I think you should be doing. If I can empower your friend and educate your friend and they take that message and they start to change their behavior, whether they're saying to you or not is credited back to truth. If those behaviors start to change, we're going to start shaping the cultural norm and that's a much more powerful and perhaps even efficient way to drive the number Social down. Social approbation is incredibly powerful. It's a more buzzworthy word to say. <laughs> but <laughs> but does, that, does that make sense in yeah, terms yeah, of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but uh, I think one of the things that I'm kind of <coughs> curious about because implicit in that is this idea that brands oftentimes, I mean, whether you're in the for-profit or the non-profit space, I think it's particularly true in the non-profit space these days, is this idea, or actually I guess we're all grappling with this, is the idea of letting go. Right. Oh my gosh. That, that you're empowering people Painful. to take your idea Painful. and your message and then interpret it, live with it, <coughs> and, and live it, yeah. right? In a way that maybe you'd come back and say, that's not exactly how I'd say it. Yeah. Or I don't know that I'm super comfortable with this. And yet the penetration that you can get when you allow people to take your story and make it their own yeah. and live it out is exponential. The potential yeah. there is just extraordinary. But it takes a lot of... There's a lot of risk implicit there. Yes. And how did you guys manage that? Yeah, it's it was it's it was and can be so painful. <laughs> um, and I, th I think painful in the sense of type A, wired tight, want to control, believe. You know, my wife will tell you I think very highly of my ability. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, you know, trying to check my self righteousness at the door. I think I can make an impact if I can get my hands in there and help shape and create and limit the liability and exposure, just like any good brand steward would. And the audience today, particularly youth and young adults, th those rules are not applicable. They're just not applicable. And placing those restrictions automatically make you, if in our case, where we're, we are trying um, very hard to be of the individual, for the individual, by the individual, putting those restrictions on automatically sends a cue that I'm corpo, I'm corporate, I'm old guy, hashtag dad. And which is a death nail Is that for actually us. a hashtag? I, I, just make it, I normally say dad hashtag just to mess it up to show like, how would that would actually screw it up? So that hashtag. Can we just use the Google and we'll find? I know you find the Google. <laughs> and so, um, and so, I, I do think I, I get the I get the tension. You know, as somebody who our greatest asset is our brand. We don't have, you know, product on every street corner like our our competition does. We don't have that distribution. I don't have that tangible asset to fall back on. It really is this, the communication and the education. Um, with a few exceptions, and I'll use this example to answer your question of how do we get comfortable with it. And so <clears throat> we had a partnership with Vans. I'm a huge fan of Vans. Mm -hmm. And uh, we worked with them over years and uh, showed up at a bunch of their events and know those people really well, know those guys really well. And we were like, you know, we should, it'd be great if we get a product produced, like an actual van, Truth Vans collab and get it done. And they were like psyched about it. Yeah, we should do that. And they have done lots of collaborations over the years. And so uh, our very first collaboration, we sort of had this like, um, uh, let's get in there and we'll take like a fact, a truth, like tobacco fact, and then we'll, we'll do a brief and we'll, we'll give it to the designers who are gonna develop the shoe and then like do a real high concept anti-smoking shoe. An anti-smoking <laughs> shoe. Right, so yeah. even as I'm saying it, you're laughing <laughs> because it seems crazy, right? <laughs> like I'm sure, and I, I will say, it was probably the best anti-smoking shoe we could have possibly designed. It was awesome. But the challenge with that was that I w we were putting so many restrictions on them because I had a bias in terms of what I, I wanted to get and what I needed from that. And, and it was frustrating for them, it was frustrating for us. Uh, we went through several different designers until we found somebody who could really like, get, us, get us closer. And then we realized, what do we really want out of this? What we really want is the consumer to go, truth in vans, I didn't see that coming, that's awesome, that's cool. They know our brand. We have like, I don't know what the brand awareness number is now. It's over 80%. Uh, affinity is super high. They, people know who we are. They know what we stand for. They like us. Um, it's a memorable brand. We're doing the heavy lift on sort of telling you what to do with the brand through all of our concerted efforts around paid and earned and other integrations. But no one would see a collab coming where they would see the two of us coming together. And once I start to develop a product and they got to spend money for it, the cost of entry is, again, back to my, just because I'm doing good, no one's going like, oh man, that's not really a great shoe. 
Uh, but I, shoot, I, I'm going to give up however many 40 bucks, 50 bucks to wear that because truth's awesome. That's No, no 18 year old's going to nope. do that. Nope. Uh, Especially when they're looking at the next one, which is the Tony Hawk band that's right. shoe, right? That's You're right. in competition that's right. in the shoe store. So, what we yeah. did uh, the next time around was to say. And I just dated myself by saying I knew Tony, Tony Hawk. Hawk. He's still the godfather. I know, he's still the godfather, still the but godfather. I don't think he's. Uh, I don't he's not the guy right and now. And I have much respect for Tony Hawk, but I yeah, don't he's, think he's the man right now. Yeah, he's. I don't even think it's Sean White, so I'm really, I'm really out of the space. I'm not even gonna try. Yeah, um, I'm gonna stop. But uh, it, it, hashtag dad, dad hashtag. Yeah, there we go. Feel free to implement that. The <laughs> um, might get a tattoo. I know. The second time around, <coughs> we basically had an honest conversation, and they said, "We we design shoes. We have an aesthetic. We dig your brand. Uh, let us do what we do." And we can talk about like how do we tell the story around why we why why are we doing it is more compelling than what the actual shoe communicates around that. But it's really the brand identity and the halo effect. And once we got out of the way and let that happen, it was of course it was better, right? The second one was better. The third one was awesome. We had Kevin Lyons, who's a street artist, a graffiti artist, do the work for us, and it got mass distribution through Journeys. It was better than we could have ever imagined, right? But it took us really going through it and it going not well, it was painful, and it was painful for our partners, it was painful for us to say, they do something better than we do. And that's somebody who's very prideful of his talent, as I mentioned earlier, I gotta swallow that. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not the best shoe designer. You don't want me designing your shoe. Uh, there are people that do this for a living. They're great at it. They have affinity the same way that we want and have affinity. And so I, I think that was a real, and there are other examples where we did the same thing with some of our partners at MTV and, and other channels where we were trying to produce content and be so prescriptive. And once we got into the, what are we trying to accomplish and, and what assets do we bring to bear that we need you to deploy and but really let you lean in, people felt the freedom. They were we, we were tapping into their creative powers in a way that we just weren't able to unleash before that. And we could step back and have some trust. And it was so much better than anything we could have imagined or prescribed. And so I think... You have just described, by the way, a pain point for a lot of people who do communications work, which is they're working with really extraordinary leadership or program staff or a board or <coughs> any number of people who have deep expertise. And asking a comms person to come in and say, let me help you take this idea and move it out into mm -hmm. the wider world, which is where ideas go out to have impact, yeah. right? They don't, they, you're not gonna get a lot of success inside your four walls. But a lot, starting that internal process of letting it go and then going out into the wider world and letting it go again is a really, really big challenge. Yeah, and I think... A cultural thing. I it's think. a cultural thing. It's a different muscle. Mm -hmm. It is. And I do think, to your point earlier, um, when you we've, we were watching and observing what was happening in terms of the generational shift and the hijacking of brands that, you know, four or five years ago, seven years ago was happening, but, not, but now is just so commonplace, but at that time it when was... When you say hijacking a brand, I think I have an idea of what you mean, but let me let you just pass by that. What do you mean when you say hijacking a brand? Well, I think uh, when I say hijacking a brand, it's, it's um, whether I give you my assets, whether I give you my logo or my font or my, my uh, video assets, you're going to be able to take them and do what you want with them. Mm -hmm. And so I can try to protect those things. Mm -hmm. um, and any good brand steward is going to do that to a certain degree. I'm not going to give native files to somebody when they ask for my native file. I'm not going to make it easy for them to, to take my brand. But the hijacking of the brand can be seen through the glass half full or the glass half empty. And so in some cases when the brand's getting hijacked and people are taking, I even think when people are taking our brand and making a mockery of us, I actually kind of enjoy that because I actually feel like you were not talking about tobacco and you went to great lengths to do a spoof of a tobacco piece of communication that you saw, you're super engaged. You know the fact now. Yeah. And so I actually think that mockery is a form of flattery to a certain degree. Oh yeah. It doesn't really, it doesn't offend me, but this idea that, that the audience is finding out ways to infiltrate the way you're communicating, the way people are thinking about you, sort of the way people, you know, the Yelps of the world, the empowerment of um, uh, your well-crafted sort of statement of mission it is irrelevant based on what's going to happen to how people are really experiencing your brand and talking about that in a public forum. And so that's what I mean in terms of hijacking your brand is I can't, I can't dictate to you what the experience is going to be like. I can help shape that, mm -hmm. I can help influence that, but you're gonna tell me what the influence is like at scale. And in some cases have much more credibility as a consumer than I'm going to have because I have a bias, right? right? I'm trying to protect something. And so that's a, 
that's uncomfortable. And there's nothing natural about letting that go. There's nothing natural about that. And but at the same time, but that, that North Star is where you come the back. North there, Star. Right? That's exactly right. We our whole existence is designed around filling the knowledge gap and trusting the consumer is going to make the right decision. And so at, we have a long track record of success doing this, 20 years plus years of documented success of speaking to the audience with respect, educating them, not telling them what to think, but trusting that if they have the right information, they're going to make the right decision. And if we take that posture, if you're engaging with us and you're hijacking my brand, you're engaging with me. And how do I use that momentum to my advantage? I mean, the reality is there's no, or very few, I should say, but there's no 18-year-old in America sitting on the edge of their bed right now saying, man, can't life, I can't ad. wait for a tobacco ad. Life would be complete if I just had another truth ad, right? <laughs> it's just not. And so for me to behave in such a precious manner with my brand that it, it, there's such a high demand for it is, is foolish. And it's absurd. I, it's right? absurd. And so I think the idea that even through mockery, how do I use that to my advantage if that's the case? Or if someone debates and we have uh, an argument where people try to shut us down on our claims, they're engaging on tobacco and they certainly weren't doing that the day before. Oh yeah, you're owning the oxygen for that period of time. So you just mentioned something that I think the, the judges, because I get the great good fortune of getting to hear the judges going through a lot of really tremendous uh, uh, nominations this year. Um, but one of the things that they found especially compelling, I think, was also somewhat surprising to them and to me. And that was this idea that the work that you were submitting represented 20 plus years of work. Yeah. And so, you know, there's maybe an instinct for, <coughs> and I'm quite sure people have had this experience where you go and the boss or someone from the team walks in and says, we did this, it's done, get it on the front page of the New York Times. Or there's some tactical win that they've put in front of them, but there's not necessarily that larger recognition that, like, the minute you engage in a communications effort, you're in the long game. Yeah. And the only way you're going to win it is a piece of its attrition, right? It's right. just committing to, to not losing for as right. long as you can. Right. Right. But talk to me about how you all, and I, I realize you had a specific mission, but, but that's such an important idea that like the ability to commit and be durable and, and persist yeah. is in fact a massive strategic advantage. Yeah. Yeah, I do. You're right. I mean, I think part of our success... Um, is uh, you know we we were well funded out of the gate and it put us at a significant advantage compared to some other nonprofits where they 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 have to think through the lens of the programmatic output as it's connected to what can I fund the programmatic output is connected to um, uh, are my funders going to be happy right mm -hmm. and so we just we didn't have the same yoke on us at that at the time that we we launched and that 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 allowed us to really focus on the north star to say we are going to be able to do something and have a conversation with the audience that other people are not going to be able to do because we're not dependent on um, that donor who may or may not be happy or may have a pet project that will force our agenda and so i think that admittedly that's some freedom and flexibility it's a little bit of a unicorn situation it's a unicorn I, and, and I, we recognize that. I'm incredibly thankful for that. I will also say that the reason we're in that position is because the tobacco industry perpetrated a fraud for decades, and they killed millions and millions of people and continue to do that worldwide. And so when you think about it in terms of what's at risk, uh, if you're not motivated to step in, it's still the number one preventable cause of death in the United States today. 1,200 Americans will die today from a tobacco-related disease. If you were to stop tobacco smoke today. Eventually, you would almost wipe out an entire cancer category. Lung cancer, 85% of lung cancer is caused by, it would almost cease to exist. And, and so when you think about the impact on the lives of these individuals, these peoples, these families, and the lost productivity, the, the healthcare burden to society based on just this one, one product alone, it's it's a it's a chance for us to have an impact on a scale that's unmatched by any any other nonprofit that I know of, and so I think the other side of the coin to your point about so number one I recognize we're unique, I don't take that lightly. Number two, the problem is vast and its mm -hmm. its its impact is far reaching. So by nature, to have that kind of impact means you're not going to solve that overnight, right? Mm -hmm. And and so it goes back to your idea of like sustainability in terms of our, our willingness to stay in the fight for a long period of time. When you get into the prevention game, 
you're, you're sort of focusing on that funnel and slowing down that funnel over time, over time, over time, over time, over time. And in the midst of that, we also recognize that product is legal. They're still selling that product, distribution on every single street corner. They're still trying to innovate that product. And you have, not, you have a whole host of individuals who are still smoking because they're now addicted. And even as those numbers go down, that's a long-term long-term process and so we were committed as an organization to say this is what we're going to do and we're committed to doing this as long as we think we're having an impact and can measure success and we're going to stay committed to that as long as we possibly can and i think with the recognition that it was not going to be a one year or a two year or a three year fight we just knew from the onset that wasn't the case and we didn't get here overnight we're not going to get out of this position overnight and it would, would, it would require an organization like us that was well-funded, <coughs> excuse me, well-funded and wasn't tethered to a particular administration. So as people are kind of coming and going, where the funding can come and go with administrations, mm -hmm. that we could sit outside of that, chart our own course, follow the North Star of the consumer, and we had a chance, we had a chance to curtail the epidemic. And we've had success doing that. And it seems to me, I'm mean, of this, <coughs> obviously, it's systemic change through culture change. Yes, yeah, which so is we call it a normative change over time, yeah, yeah. So the other thing I find fascinating, and I think it's probably a particular case for you all because this is a public health thing, but there is a long history in the health realm, in the public health realm, of measurement. Right. Right, and there's also, I think, I don't mean to, to cast dispersions here, but I think there's a lot of folks who work in the communication space who th say, you know, I don't think you can really measure the impact of our work. And I yeah. think one of the things we recognized, or the judges recognized, was that you all not only took baseline reflections of where you were every few months, every couple of years, yeah. but that you also course corrected through that. Oh yeah. Talk to me about that process because there's a lot <coughs> of people <coughs> who I think think, I'm going into communications work because I was an English major and I write nicely. Yeah, yeah. And increasingly I'm of the view that that's true and necessary, but, and Emma's gonna punch me because she was an English major who writes beautifully, but, it's also true that we all have to go a little bit deep geek and yeah. get comfortable with looking deep at geek. data and numbers to better understand how to be most effective yes. because, yes. Yes. you know, even the Washington Capitals, I'm going to give a shout out to our local hockey team, you know, they, their uniforms are red, but they sell red hats and blue hats because some people don't like to wear red. Right, right, right. right. So uh, the question, I suppose, is talk to me about how data helps you do your work better yeah. and become more precise that's communications work and how you're measuring. Yeah, that's a big, that's a, that's that's a I know that's a hundred thousand yeah. dollar question, but, but it's honestly good. you'll do that. a lot of good if you have Yeah, I love that. Um, did you say data geek? What'd you say? You deep, deep geek. geek. Deep but you geek. can, but data geek is I think a piece deep of geek. it. It's, uh, that's it's a, a particular, it's a particular type that's of it's, I think it's another hashtag too. Dad like deep a, geek. Yeah, deep, 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 deep dad geek. I kind of like that. Um, so here, we have a team of, I don't know, 20 social scientists that work uh, at the Truth Initiative with... That's worth just stopping right there. You have folks on the team whose job is to measure how effective That's you are. That's all they do. That's all they do. Yeah. I don't measure it. They do. Um, and we publish on that. And uh, I would say that was a, that, that, that is unique in and of itself as well. I mean, that, that does make... But, but we are committed to that. that. That they have been, that discipline has been integrated into our organization from its inception. And the idea that, and so I do think what's interesting with us is if you look at our body of work, uh, we were rated either Ad Age or Ad Week, I just can't remember which one, I apologize, is one of the top 15 campaigns of the 21st century. We've won, you mentioned this earlier, I don't know, 500 plus awards, Emmys, Lions, we won two Epis a couple weeks ago. Well trophied up. In some cases for efficacy of what we do, but in some cases because it's really strong creative work. And so I, I do think we're an example of you can be creative and have some of the best creative in the marketplace and still be effective. Those things do not... They're um, not in conflict. They're not in conflict. Um, and so I, I embrace that early on because I see the data as being power. Uh, not power in, a way, uh, power in a way to make sure that we're effective with the North Star. And, and so our, the way we measure... Um, there's sort of three different buckets. We do a lot on the formative side of things, a ton of formative work. What's going on with the cohort? How is it different than the cohort before? What's trending? What's in? What's out? Some of that we do ourselves. Some of that we get from third parties. Some of that our agencies will do, which um, we, you know, we buy and pay for that, but there's some of that's syndicated. And there's a process that we 
we operationalize, it's calendarized in terms of how are we keeping tabs on what's going on. And when you say the cohort, I'm going to just assume you are not looking at demographics. You're looking at psychographics yes. and deeper data than De that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, what you say they? of course, but let's just remember yes, some folks yeah. are not. It's a fair question. Not, you, you guys are award winning because you are so far out in front of so many of us that we have a lot to learn from you. Well, and I would say that, so, here, so I think what we do is a matter of scale. I think it would be a mistake to hear what we're talking about and think, well, we can't afford that, and then to lean back. If you're tempted to lean back, do not do that. Because I think the discipline of knowing who are you trying to target and what is relevant to them and how do I make myself relevant in that sphere of influence, what does success look like, what are the, what are the, what are the benchmarks along the way, all of that discipline of just knowing what you're trying to accomplish and who the audience is, anybody can do that. Now, whether you're going to have a longitudinal cohort of 14,000 people or whether you're going to ask 10 people in your science class, it's a matter of scale. But the discipline of understanding and knowing what to ask and how to measure is something that I think every brand uh, can implement and should be doing. Mm -hmm. So you're right. I didn't mean to overstate that. But I, I, I do from time to time get the, well, we can't afford that. Well, maybe oh, not. With, without a doubt. I think that's a lot of people is to simply say it's that <coughs> I, I don't know how to do this. Yeah. And then I can find the impediments or obstacles that are going to stop me from doing that. When in fact, even if it's something as informal, picking up the phone that's and right. calling a couple of people you think it's might engage with your, with your brand, that's not scientifically <coughs> conclusive. But it's a hell of a lot it's better than point. wandering. Up. Yeah, it's, data data it's, it's it's so much better than wandering around I totally in the dark. Agree with hoping. You. I totally agree with you. And so we we um, I think with being a little bit older, having a wife, kids, and I, I there there is a healthy sense of I don't know what I don't know. Mm -hmm. And and so if you were to come to our office and look around, you would see that we have a very diverse team. Um, age, race, ethnicity, gender, where they're from, backgrounds, and that is a prized element of who we are. Let's talk about that. I will get back to the to yeah, the, back to the piece, but I just want to make sure that you this is that. something I think a lot of people are really wrestling with. This is there's sort of a, a buzzword in the social sector, in the foundation, and nonprofit space around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how do we internalize that? How do we operationalize that? How do we live that through our values? But but I think the fundamental piece is it's such a core strength it's to be a core a, strength. If you're in the business of moving ideas out into the wider world, if everyone in the office looks the same, you probably aren't going to be very good at your jobs. That's right. And so I'm a, I'm a minority on the team that I run. Uh, just to my age alone <laughs> makes me a minority. I, I um, know that feeling. Sorry, but the uh, but the benefit is particularly when we there's only so much media I can consume. And so in my former life, I used to be I would think of myself as being an audiophile and. In my former life, I would pick out music for some of the commercials. Back when we had record do. stores, exactly yeah, right. I remember it well. Water it records on Sixth and Congress in Austin, and <laughs> um, but my ability to consume enough media to where I have my finger on the pulse of what's going on is just compromised by my stage of life, and it's impossible for me to do that. Nor should I be the one doing it at this stage. But having I'm just using this as an example, but having people around me who are who are navigating in culture, they're consuming um, all of the sort of cultural inputs, they're contributing to culture, they have a very different lens and a point of view that th th there's no way I can close that gap. And I, and, and I don't want to. And right. so if I, I love, we love to have people that, that see the world differently than I do. I, I definitely, I got this market, I got this corner covered. You got the dad thing. I got the dad, dad thing. I got yeah. dad or dad hashtag covered. What I need are the people on our team who are music bloggers on the side, who are producing their own art on the side, who are um, way into fashion and developing their own fashion line on the side. Why? Because their lens, their, the, the influence that they have and their ability to speak into who are the influencers in culture is just going to be unmatched when it comes to, if you compare them to me. And so we are surrounded by people that think, see, and engage in the world differently than I do. And that adds to the richness of our debate. And it also means as a leader, and many times where I have to say, I have to trust the people around me that they're making the right decision. And I can look at the data points, but when it comes to, is that the right t-shirt that we should have on the Vans Warp Tour? I probably shouldn't be the one making that final decision. And I, I can ask questions, I can ask, you know, uh, is that appropriate? Is it not appropriate? Uh, is that, um, um, do we have enough, I don't know, unisex? You know, I, I can ask those questions, and I have the ability to speak into designs. Uh, I, I still like to think I have a design aesthetic. But when it comes to what's trending right now for a 12 to 18 year old or 18 to 24 year old audience, 
I need to trust the people around me have a better finger on the pulse than I do and empower them. Ask the questions, but empower them to help make that decision. And when we do that, the work gets better. People are engaged more. Our attrition rate is so low, super low. And the, the quality of the work, the environment, the joy, the impact, it all just gets cranked up and up and up and up and up. And so we that's a, a little bit of agency, right? Yeah, totally, yeah. totally. So when we, I, I stopped you, you were talking about uh, data measurement. and measurement and how important that is and how you <coughs> ought not to be pushing back and leaning away if you don't have the resources of yes. the Truth Initiative. So I'll go first on the measurement. The data side, we've got a lot of people on our team as well that, that are deep into the data. We have our own DMP. We run a lot of the programmatic media, if you speak that language, through our DMP. And we're looking at and analyzing, like, how is it working? We're building out our audience types. We're trying to get them into deeper engagement. That, that's its own animal. It's a big animal. And I think it is also very important for us as an organization, particularly when we think about how do we communicate in a one-to-one -one environment to do that and build out that muscle? I'm going to talk about the measurement because I think it's part of what the award is for, is sort of our sustained success. And mm -hmm. so, as I started to mention earlier, there's the formative work, um, so three kind of buckets. The formative work, then sort of like a, when we're in it, the work is in the marketplace, how, what's the feedback loop in terms of how it's working? And then there's the Long term, are we having an impact? Are we not having an impact? So those are kind of the three the three buckets, and they work in tandem. Mm -hmm. It is this, it is a, a fluid organism, but they all play a very unique role, and they all build on each other. So the formative work goes into that. What's going on in culture? That's one data point. I won't do justice to this entire bucket, but one is like what's going on, what's trending, what's not. The listening piece. The listening piece. Um, who who are the influencers right now? Why is MMA in or is it out? It was in, is it not out? Like what what's competing for sort of that mind share, and how do we make ourselves relevant in that space? It's horrifying to know. I just heard MMA and I was like, I don't know what that is, but now oh, I oh yeah yeah I got martial arts yeah yeah. Um, also part of that formative research is what's happening with the ta tobacco. Like what are the smoking rates? What's going on? So the formative can be qual and quant can be mm -hmm. listening as well. So if it's proactive and it's reactive. We're going into the marketplace. We're trying to understand what makes you tick. Mm -hmm. What makes you tick in St. Louis versus Mobile versus Los Angeles? Is there some unanimity? Is it is it breaking down by region? Are teens still teens? Are young adults still young adults? Is there, you know, what does that what does that space look like? And then from the formative, we go into Here's how we want to position our issue and make ourselves relevant. And then we develop work. We spend a lot of time on that formative side. The majority of our time and energy is spent on this formative side. Then when we actually go and develop that work, um, then it's in like, how do we get into market and test it? We produce work. It can take a lot of different forms. There's a lot of testing of like, how are people responding, how are they not responding. There's a, it's a qual and quant phase. And before we push anything out into the marketplace, we do a quantitative forced exposure sort of testing to understand, are you getting the message or are you not getting the message? Uh, what's the affinity now that you have for the brand? What are you going to do with this? And because we've done that for so long, we have our own set of benchmarks. We understand how the campaigns are working. And by the way, what happens in pre-market actually does translate really well into what happens in the real world. Once communication gets into the marketplace, we do a media monitoring. So it's a three-week, four-week rolling average where every single, every month I'm looking at, like, are we on track? Like, what's our awareness of the work? What's the affinity? What's the recall? What's the motivation? So that if there's and you're a not, and when you're doing this media market, the media market's much more saturated and expansive than it was. Oh 10 my years gosh! Ago. So you're not yes. just doing television. No, you're not doing radio. You're doing Insta. You're doing Snap. You're <coughs> it's hard. Yeah, it's, I don't even. I can't even imagine where you are. Hard are, to do My that. guess is most of the best work you're doing, I will never see. That's right. I've got the hashtag dad. Or right, right, right. Yeah, some of the best work we've done is uh, not to get sidetracked is. Uh, we set a new benchmark for engagement on Snapchat earlier this year. We did a, an ad on erectile dysfunction. And um, would you know that erectile dysfunction can happen to men as early as 20 if you're smoking? And so uh, talk about uh, a, a topic. I wasn't caring about smoking if I'm 18 to 20 years old, but now that you're talking about erectile dysfunction, you suddenly have my attention. And oh, by the way, back to the social conversation, I, maybe I need to communicate that to you, but it's, maybe it's more important for me to communicate that to the broader audience so they start to look at you differently when you are smoking. And so um, it's a long way of saying where we show up and how we understand what impact that's having on the brand is certainly diffused in a way today that it, it wasn't even four years ago. 
But that media tracking is ongoing, so it allows us to course correct. Mm -hmm. We also look at sentiment analysis. What are people saying? What are they not saying? How are they engaging with us? We have a big dashboard on like understanding of people viewing the ads. What's the completion rate? What's the completion rate by platform? What are they doing from that completion rate? Are we converting people? Are we not converting people? Are we getting more people to convert from Insta versus all that stuff's going into this sort of like we're in the moment, how do we course correct? Because if we wait, at the same time, we have a longitudinal cohort. So we're following 14,000 kids over, I think we're now into year four of that. Mm -hmm. And so we go in at particular moments in time and we get a baseline. What are your attitudes and beliefs and your intentions? And then we come in six, nine months later, six, nine months later. That's a beast of an instrument. Mm -hmm rare to have that kind of an impact, but that is what we publish on, right, in terms of are we showing, based on the media overlay, we know how much exposure you're, we, we are giving you, where you were at baseline, holding constant, where you live, if you've been exposed to other ads, how are we showing a shift in your, your knowledge, your attitudes, your beliefs, and ultimately your behavior? It's a long-term play, but if I wait every six, nine months to get that data point, if that's my only data point, I've lost a lot of time. Mm -hmm. What's at stake for me? More kids are gonna go smoke. We know that half of the people who smoke are gonna die from it. So if you start smoking as a teen, some stats will say one in three, some will say half. But if you look over the course of our, our success, we are able to document that we saved a million people from smoking. So that's either 333,000 or 500,000 people that did not die of cancer as a result of our work, which we feel so proud of. That's a high bar, because oh, yeah. if, if we get it right, people aren't dying of cancer. If we get it wrong, people are gonna die of cancer. And so we can't wait six months, nine months, 12 months. We have to know three weeks, four weeks in, are we on track or are we not on track? Are we on track or are we not on track? And so if you think about, I probably haven't done justice to my research friends who work with me, apologies for that. <laughs> that is a very intentional, sophisticated uh, process that does not, handicap our ability to have the most creative work biased in the marketplace around a social issue. It does not handicap us from breaking Snapchat's benchmark for engagement. It does not stop us from winning the Lions and the Effies and, and the these things can, and the Jones Awards. <laughs> these things can exist in harmony and they do because all of that empowers us to have an impact on our North Star. If we can get that data Ultimately, I want that 18-year-old version of me or you to not pick up that cigarette, just to pass on it at a party, just to pass. So how do you build the, and I, I realize that you all started from this space, and because that public health has that culture of measurement and data, because you know, you know, <coughs> what is the age rate in America? What's the level of cancer, a new incidence of cancer in America? Because they're measuring it all the time. There's that history and that culture of it. We did a study uh, about a year ago, Tristan is just behind the camera, uh, led this, uh, and we asked people, what were the large growing trends in communications, and, and what, were, what was required to do this work well? It won't surprise you to hear people said creativity, strategy, uh, many of the sort of things you might expect. Yeah. One of the things we heard, but not at the level we might have expected, was data and research. Mm. The people didn't necessarily put the emphasis on it that mm. you all do. Mm. And so I guess if you could even just sort of look to the camera and appeal to people, <coughs> tell people, like, how important is this to your work? And I realize it's not yeah. what you do, but you use it in order oh, to yeah. do what you do. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think for us, the, I think when people shy away from data, it's one of two, it, my experience has been either A, they don't understand it, and so there is this sort of like, this so Chevy Chase, I will told, was told there will be no math. Right, 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 right. I was told there will be no math, and there, there, people are on their heels. Um, and, and that's an honest, I get that, that's an honest response. If people don't understand what does it mean to have a, a statistically significant sample size or statistically significant shift in attitudes and how is that correlated to, that, that's, I get it, I get mm -hmm. it. Um, so you either, you either don't understand the language or you're, you, um, it's this hang up about creativity. Either place it's, it's, it's based in fear. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 this, it's a fear-based sort of lens versus if you're trying to have an impact, the posture has to be, I think, I will do whatever is required to make sure that I can help people, in our case, not die of cancer. If I really don't want people to die of cancer, I'm the first one to say, man, I don't get it. Tell me, break it down to a fifth grade reading level so I can understand exactly what you're talking about. Just pardon me for being 
like not smart on this topic, but help me get there. Um, the second point of that is, we all know from being in the creative field that drawing sort of the sandbox, for lack of a better term, is actually freedom. It spawns, in some cases, some of the best creativity when you have that sort of tight box. It's when people get paralyzed, it's like, I could do anything. Well, oh my gosh, I could do anything. I don't, I don't even know where to begin. And so, the, the, but I do think it's fear-based in mm -hmm. a lot of cases. And so, I, there's just a, um, <clears throat> for us, the problem is so vast and so broad, and our competition is so powerful, so well-funded. They spend in a day what we spend in a year. Um, it's arguably one of the most addictive products on the planet. Right. And so we are the David versus Goliath. And so I think we, we've had to take a posture of humility. That doesn't mean that we don't have hubris. Um, but but it, it, I think it just it serves us all well, I think, to, to be cognizant of the fact that it's okay not to know the answer. It's okay to ask for help and to take a position of, back to the way that we think about our teams and our staffing, the more we have people, get a scientist, get a mathematician, get somebody who understands data and speaks data geek, like get them in there and empower them to do that for you so that you can make a better decision. Like to me, that's the fun and the joy of the beauty of the rhythm of that. Like I, I'm not an independent contractor that I would, I would wither, which I'm assuming most of the people that are listening to this, they live in an environment, they work in this field because they like working with people and serving mm -hmm. complex problems. And so I think data, to shy away from data, like just embrace that fear. That's the best advice I can give on that front. Yeah, and I'm the first person to tell you, I don't do math, but I have, have come to realize, like you, if you're so focused on outcomes, you don't know if you're having an impact if you are not measuring. That's right. If you don't know that Monday is different from Sunday, and the only way you can do that is measuring, right? Uh, two more questions, because I know we've taken up a lot of yeah, your time. Yeah, no, that's okay. So one is, uh, you use this word exposure, and it's yes. such an important idea, you know? It's the, the old Ronald Reagan line, this is just somebody who was president when we were young, right? Uh, who said, you know, the minute you get sick of saying it is the first time they've heard it. Mm. So obviously, I'm, I'm certain that's gotta be true for everybody, yeah. regardless of your age. <coughs> but exposure is so important. <coughs> so you all are not doing one and dones. No. And you're not putting things out and saying, I bought it once and I've gotta run on Tuesday evening and I'm right, guaranteed right, of having right. an audience of, I'll make something up, 100,000 yeah. people in our audience. That's not how it works for you. Right. Give me a sense of like what exposure means. At yeah. This <coughs> so there are metrics for that in terms of if you think about television exposure just as an easy one to think through and there are standards in terms of when you get wear out when you don't get wear out which is based on this sort of reach and frequency model of the GRP of how many times do you see an ad before it breaks through and and I, again I but that's helpful I don't think that is the the gold standard exposure for us you know a lot of that we measure and there are sort of like individual tactics of you know have, have has this message sort of reached its saturation? Or when you can trend people talking about it, are they sharing it, are they viewing it, are they commenting on it? And you can see that sort of curve. And um, which I think in many cases is more important than say the traditional sort of reach frequency model because the consumer is going to be telling you as soon as they're not engaging and they're not tuning in, they're not doing the video view completes, they're, uh, they're not swiping up if they're in Snapchat, like that, I've had enough. Um, for us, that's why the brand has also been very important because we're not tethering ourselves to any one piece of communication. Mm -hmm. And so I think the idea that to open up that aperture to think about the entire consumer experience gives you the freedom to not hang on so tightly to any one piece of communication to let it go. Because it's about this overall experience, which is why we look at brand affinity and brand health. And we, we, we do tie that back with that three-week rolling average, that media monitoring I talked mm -hmm. about. It's very important for us to understand if we start to see brand affinity slipping, maybe it's... If you look at the GRP model, maybe our campaign hasn't worn in. So I'll give you an example. Um, we, we just came off of a year of our main sort of messaging point was on social justice. It's a pillar in the way that we talk about the issue for the audience and it's effective. But, and we talked about it for almost an entire year. By the time we got to the end of the year, we were starting to see people just weren't engaging. They were getting, well, why? Because they had issue fatigue. I mean, if you think about a, a 12 to 24 year old, and, the, and not just in terms of the, the tools that we have, but the level of conversation taking place, what we were seeing time and time again is people were like, yes, these issues are important, but I just need a, I need a break, man. Yeah, I, I just think we've all felt that way. Give me a break. <laughs> yeah. And so it took us a little while to see it, but we started to see a little bit of the engagement and the affinity. People were just getting tired. Mm -hmm. and. It, 
it had nothing to do with the merit of what we were saying, right? It was true, but we stayed on that beat a little longer than we probably should have. And then when we came back with the erectile dysfunction ad that I mentioned, um, which is called Twinkle Twinkle Little Dick, if you can look it up, um, on, um, <laughs> I know, I, I, said, I went there, I did go there. <laughs> Dad hashtag. Um, it broke the engagement on Snapchat. And it just was, it, of course it did, right? And so looking back, we're like, well, of course. People were like, it was new news. It was relevant to something they actually care about. Um, it's hyper relevant to an 18 to 24 year old male in particular. Oh, sure. And it was fun. And so a little naughty, and for all of those reasons, and 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 it worked. The smart thing to walk into a bar and talk about. Right. Guess what? Right. Right. Cigarette you're smoking. Yeah. Um, Okay. So last question. I'm going to play the what if game with you. Yes. If you'll if you'll if you'll play along. So you have the great good fortune of serving this extraordinary organization that has done a tremendous amount of good. And I think if folks on the other side, I'll do this for us all, is to say thank you. Oh. Because what you've done is amazing and extraordinary. And as a dad. You are shifting the culture on a profound way that mm. hopefully will, will, will lead to my little girls never, ever picking up a cigarette. Here, here. Um, but you have the luxury of working at the Truth Initiative. Yeah. So my, my question to you would be, so some of the folks tuning in here are working at a foundation, or they're working at a different or, uh, a <coughs> policy shop, or any number of different kinds of nonprofits, perhaps somebody who's feeding people. And many of them have really limited resources, particularly for their function. Right? They may be working as a team of one, so they don't have access to data yeah. scientists, where they may be uh, a foundation where there's two or three people on it, but there's no culture of communication within the organization. Um, if we were to, so if, as a what if game, what if, Eric, I said, I'm going to hire you to be the very first ever communications director at a foundation, so mm-hmm. a grant making organization gives money away, that's their principal purpose, <coughs> to uh, support the arts. Yeah. Broadly. Yeah. Not in the city of Boston or wherever, but sp- but, sp- but lift up the arts in America. That's mm-hmm. your mission. You're the first ever comms director. What do you do in wow. the first year or two of your job? Number one, I like this idea. Um, lifting up arts, particularly because uh, you can tell how trained I'm mapping it back to if kids are engaged in art, how it enriches their lives and whatnot. I, I think... And your mission is to, the organization's mission is to give money to yeah. nonprofits, which could be that after school arts program, could right. be the local symphony, could right. be uh, a camp that focuses on arts education, yeah. could be support for the public school system that's been chopping off funding for arts teaching or yeah. arts specials or whatever they call them. I think that the ch- number one, I would do a lot of listening. I would engage uh, and try to understand and look for success stories, places where things didn't work out well, to understand the road that has been traveled to get to where we are. I'd want to understand what are all the elements at play that have caused this erosion. I'm sure you hit that exactly, but I feel like there's an erosion of arts, particularly in schools. Like Mm -hmm. what's causing that? And what are those factors? Um, And then importantly, would understand who's already in the spaces, who's trying to make an impact, right? And this is how my, my brain works. And then I would look for, because it's an overwhelming proposition, yeah. right? Back You're talking to about systemic change without the luxury of all the firepower you all are bringing. It's massive. Bring. Yeah. And I, would, I think where I would spend my time is trying to identify the role that I could play. And I would really spend my time articulating what success looks like, mapping that back to the kind of funding that I do have, and really narrow cast on what what is my piece of this pie that I believe I can make an impact on, and also build the case on why I think that small piece of pie can lead to something larger. And I would try to, I would test that theory, and I would I would test it and to see what kind of can it work. I would ask, I would invite people in um, to shoot holes in that, and. Once you I invite people in, would that be folks on the staff? Because presumably a piece of this staff, is the culture shift you're going with the outside. Yoga. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, when we've done things like even the evaluation models of our campaigns, we invite other evaluators to look at our model to say, like, what do you think? Um, is, this, uh, is this the right evaluation model? Yes or no? And people will say, I love it, hate it, don't like it. Here's how you can make it better. All of that goes into, by the time we actually put that big, like, we feel really good about that, or better than we did when we started. We're smarter. Mm -hmm. And so scale that down to invite people in to talk about those things. Not to make the decision for you, but um, there will be a pattern of what you hear. And then I think from that that time forward, getting very focused and being able to articulate what my mission and success looks like. 
and let that be the lens for how I dole out sort of the funding, if I understood the, the business model. Um, and then my funding goes towards organizations that are doing exactly what we said we would do. Well, yeah, but I guess I, I, to be sort of more precise, your role would be the communications director. Oh, sorry, I was thinking foundation. I was in charge of it. It would be fun, right? It would be fun. I just uh, took you. Some, some, some comms people see, get grant making authority, well, but most That don't. goes back to my claim earlier, I think very highly of my skills. You I just let me in the door. Be, I, yeah, you immediately went and to I the took bank. over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, give me the, give me the steering wheel. Let me drive. Um, so in the communication space, what would I do with that? I think um, perhaps the responsibility if I'm in the communication space would be how do we articulate that, that mission vision in a way that people can get on board. Um, but, but even then, I think it would be pressure testing the assumptions that are we articulating the audience properly? Are we defining the audience in a way that makes sense to people on the outside looking in? Um, are people um, motivated by that? Um, is it an audience that we think actually really exists? Is it a place that we can own that other people can't own? Um, if that helps. Yeah. I, I, I guess, is that too me, nebulous? Let, no, I think it's, it, this is a challenge a lot of the folks in the network face, which is, you know, there are organizations that are on a journey to trying to recognize communications. My own bias is that Every foundation and nonprofit is in the ideas business. Yeah. Strip away whatever else they do, whether they're giving away money or they're feeding somebody who's hungry or any number of worthy outcomes. The purpose, the animate thing that animates the organization is an idea yeah. that people shouldn't go hungry, that we should lift up the earth, yeah. that we should eradicate disease, we should stop <coughs> And taking that idea out into the wider world cannot almost never be the function of a programmatic piece yeah. of work, that it is a communications function. Yeah. Taking that idea out yeah, into the wider world in an effective way is a communications task. Therefore, communications work is a strategic lever to affect change. You guys are yeah. fundamentally, that's all you do. That's what we do. Right? But that is not the norm at most organizations. Yeah. So most communications directors, and this isn't totally fair, so guys, you can come at me with this, but, but a lot of organizations don't necessarily see communications as a strategic lever on par with if they're a grant-making organization, the money that they give out, or if they're in the nonprofit space, the number of folks that they feed. Yeah. I'm always a believer, it's an accelerator. I totally if you want to have more people participating, or receiving the meals, or receiving funds, or applying for funds, or whatever the measure of, of success looks like for you, you've got to get the word out broader yeah. and more widely in yeah. a more meaningful way that resonates. Yeah. And ideally, that attracts people to do the work for you and take that message out into the wider world. So that even if they're not ever going to work directly with you, the idea has traveled out yeah. there. it's well said. Um, how do you do that work well? If you were stuck in that position of, of landing into that job, how do, you, how do you get your colleagues on board with that kind of vision? You know, part of the one, well, I'll relate it back to some of the things that we do. Like, we, we, we look for best in class, like what are other brands that aren't in our space? What are other brands that have a high affinity with the same market we're going after? What are they doing and why? And how are they positioning themselves and why? And l we look for, I look for those patterns. And so in some cases, it's, a, it's another data point. Mm -hmm. And so to your point you made earlier, there's, there are a lot of ways that we can aggregate data to help tell a story and to help motivate people so that they can catch the vision. And in some cases, I guarantee you, these people are gonna be in organizations where if you were to ask mm -hmm. your organization, what are the top five, just take a poll, you, if you're, you're, you're C-suite, your leadership, what are the top five brands that you respect and why? And then if you were to go back and look at those top five brands, there will be a pattern that emerges that may not exist in your organization that you can map back to. And I think part of it is, People needing to understand how it's applicable to where they are. You know, like people can have affinity for Apple, they can have affinity for Google and these other brands, but understanding like how do I apply what's going on there into my organization is I think the role of the communications expert to mm -hmm. say, like, uh, let me, once I understand the currency for you, you love fill in the blank, Under Armour. Why do you love it? I'm not actually an Under Armour guy. I was sorry. But, but that's all right. That's all right. Callaway. Uh, uh, no. but the, uh, <coughs> not at for either. But like finding out what those and getting an idea of what those elements are, I, I think the burden is on me in the communications role to connect the dots. That's something you care about. Right. How do I connect the dots to something that I care about and why? And th that, I think, tactically, we do that a lot internally. Our board is made up of elected officials, so we have governors, attorney generals, we have public health officials, very serious people. Mm -hmm. um, none of them are in the 18 to 24 year old audience. None of them are, right? And uh, they see all the work. In some cases, we need them to approve different elements of what we do, certainly the strategic vision. 
but my ability or our ability as an organization to get them on board is directly connected to us doing our homework and understanding the audience. What does the North Store care about and why? Don't take my word for it. Hear it from them. Mm -hmm. Here's what they are saying and why. Here are the brands that they associate with and why. Here's the behavior that they engage with with these brands and why. Here's where the gap is. Here's where we want to be. It's tethered to our success. Do you see that strategic underpinning? They go, yeah. Then I have permission to talk about it, whether it's erectile dysfunction or whether it's social justice, any way I see fit, as long as I'm measuring it, as long as I'm getting them on that pathway mm -hmm. to where I want to go. Outcomes focused. And so I do think the idea of everybody's going to be an armchair quarterback when it comes to writing copy. Everybody thinks they can come up with the best uh, press release or the best title for your, your homepage. That's just human nature. But I think being able to to articulate it in terms that your, your people around you understand and, and connect it back to things that they value, you can do that, but that's the onus is on me to do that. I have to understand what the governor of fill-in-the-blank state or the AG of fill-in-the-blank, what does, what does that individual care about and why? Do we have an overlap between what the North Star cares about? If, if yes, there's a pathway mm -hmm. to get them there, but the burden is on me to do that. It, no one's going to make it easy for me. We have to leave it there because we've taken a lot more of your time than we asked for. So uh, I will say thank you very, thank very you. much. Congratulations really on the fun. Jones Award. Thank you. We're looking forward to hosting you in San I'm Francisco. Excited We're going to have a good time combo. there. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, just as a dad, thanks a lot. Well, well, thank you for saying doing. that. Yeah, I appreciate so that. It was extraordinary and important, and we hope you keep doing it for a good long time to come. Thank you. Until eventually you put yourselves out of business because there's no more work to be done. I would love for that to be the case. Wouldn't That's that be great? Goal. That's the goal. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Do appreciate you being with us, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks.